One of the things that I've always maintained about, or not always, but it seems important to me about a painting, is the orientation of the viewer to the, the surface of the, of the, of the canvas, the, the corners, and the, the sense of the center of the, of the canvas, of, its, of the center which relates in turn to our own symmetry, uh, our feeling of uh, left and right, of course, and up and down. In looking at this Vermeer, uh, one of the things that, that strikes me almost immediately in those terms is the fact that, that the head of the woman is, I think, dead center, or very close to it, if you consider the whole mass of it. Uh, slightly below the midpoint in terms of up and down, but centered in terms of left and right. Now, the, the emotional uh, meaning of, of centering, I think, is illustrated in this painting because the, the, the sense of, uh, sort of gravity and dignity that this figure has is, I think, due to the fact that that symmetry is play, played off against very active um, counter-asymmetrical elements, those being the window on the far left and the, and the window, the window sill on the far left and the window frame that, that projects into the, the middle area of the picture with a kind of force against the the position of the head and the drapery to the right, which pulls to the right of center, of course. That, that play and, and counterplay of left, right in relationship all across the middle section to the symmetry of the, of the head in terms of left and right seems to me to have something to do with, with the kind of emotional impact of, that, of the painting as a whole. I, I'm thinking now of, of things that, uh, that we, we have mentioned previously in, in the talking about painting. The, the capacity that a, that a responsive viewer has to move with the rhythms, to feel the, the rhythms of a painting, not in a, in a passive way, but, but actively and almost physically, the, the empathetic power to, uh, which a, a sensitive observers have to ride with these forms as they, as they move through space. And the need on the part of the artist, of course, in controlling that, uh, that physical empathetic reaction is, is important. In the case of this painting, the, um, the variety of, of speeds of movement and, and the way the, the pul these pulsations are made to, to either go slow, fast, to, to move uh, in long uh, continuities, uh, followed by intermediate ones, by short ones, by other variations, the fact that, that your eye can move throughout this uh, this image, this painting, and find that that that, that sequential movement of, of I'm now talking specifically about contours is is maintained with interest and control at every every point, every everywhere you look. Kenneth, as I understood what you said, you were impressed with the symmetry working against the asymmetrical factors in the painting. Um, this was the only point that I wanted to make, and I didn't mean to interrupt you now. You were talking about the interplay. Well, now that, you, now that you've mentioned that, of course, the whole figure, it's not just the head. The head, the head is kind of a focus, but the whole, the whole figure of the woman uh, obviously has a symmetrical relationship. Uh, but when you mention that, it reminds me of, 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 of a certain kind of uh, facility in painting that I find very moving. And that is to take a, a direction, uh, as in this case, the, the positive verticality of that figure. And then, as against that, that felt uh, force of the, of the vertical, to play off a, a series, a whole sequence, in the case of this, of this image, of, of counter rhythms, as in the case of those curves, of uh, very intricate and constantly controlled variations within that one, within that one uh, framework of a direction. So that the, the curve of, of the head and the curve of the hair, the curve across the collar, the, the, the small golden uh, variations within the black of the sleeve, the little curve at the back of her, of her the, long, uh, the longer continuities of curve and the curve of her neck in relationship to the curve of her back, the relative straightness of the bodice, that, that constant el elaboration on themes, in this case, mostly curved themes, we're within that, the dominant framework of a direction is one of the things that, I, that good artists do, it seems to me. 
This, of course, is carried on also in terms of the shadow that, that relates to, uh, that is placed directly above her head. I wonder if what the remarks you were making are are relative to, to the ideas that I have in mind that seem to be to, uh, to relate to what you're saying, which is that he works with the rigidity, which is uh, almost um, predictable in the sense of, of it being apparent, uh, the play of the very strongly centrally placed figure working against the left and the right, which are so much in contrast. I wonder if this is a continuation then, talking about the play of the rigid against the asymmetrical, to speak about the very uh, positive tripartite organization that is in the painting. It's one of the, uh, aside from an example in 20th century painting or a triptych from uh, rather early Italian painting, it's one of the uh, prime examples, I think, of where you get the artist working with um, as strong an example of the tripartite organization. And by that, I mean that the composition is divided with by very strong verticals, the curtains running nearly from top to bottom on the right side, the curtains plus the casement of the window and the lower part, or rather the upper part of the chair, make a division on the left side in which we could say that the composition is divided, the central part being the dominant area, and it is divided by the um, area to the right, the drapery, making far less uh, interest than the area on the left in terms of variation of tone. We get only the greens on the right-hand side, but on the left-hand side we have subdivisions of value plus shape interest, or which uh, counteract um, the, the right-hand side. Uh, I would think of the left side, however, as being subdominant and the right side as being minor in such a subdivision. The painter here has centered our interests in such a way uh, that he makes a division running through the middle of the composition, having then a side to the left and the side to the right. And in my opinion, the side to the right uh, with the drapery does not make as many demands on me in one way as the subdivision on the left-hand side. Uh, in another way, it's almost a contradiction because he makes new demands and different demands, and I'm wondering if this uh, balance of working one thing against another, as in this case, a large area of the greens here where there are um, uh, a variety of linear changes uh, plus configurations which are repeating motifs that are found elsewhere. I wonder if that uh, doesn't make a strong uh, impression in terms of its initial importance and then it seems to fade or rather is superseded by uh, the interest that the left-hand side takes which does not have uh, the swinging sweeping curves in it uh, running from top to bottom. The curves seem to be only at the top and only at the bottom. We have to move out of that section moving over into the area to the center before we get the repetition of the curves. The way I read it is to read then the center division with the figure and the blank wall in back of her as being dominant and the area to the right, the drapery, as being minor, the area to the left, including the casement of the window, to be subdominant. I think the interesting change uh, takes place in that the drapery makes immediate demands on us, being the longest and most unbroken lines in the composition. The tone of the green is very close to the tone in the sleeves and bodice of the lady, as well as the configurations are on a smaller scale, but not only relate to her in terms of the diamond formations that we see, but if we look into the window in the casement, we find that in the upper part, there are variations of this in the mullion window itself. That thing you just mentioned about the repetition of the motifs continues in more ways than one throughout this thing. In some cases, as you mentioned, it's more or less arbitrarily organized within, within drapery, but it occurs also e either diamond shape or wedge shape in the little, in the, in the what, do, what do you call those things? The hold the wood? No, not the mullion. I see the mullion. It's, it's in the chair, but in, it, in those, those small uh, hinges in, in, in the window, it's repeated also there. And in, a, in another way, it's repeated in t certain larger forms. I'm talking now about a kind of a wedge shape, which can be seen in terms of the, of, the, of the red curtain on the, it also occurs down there in that drapery. 
but in a, in a larger way, the red curtain on the left and the, and the large green curtain on the, on the right also, in a sense. Well, what we're getting at, I think, is that in all good paintings, there is an incredible kind of, of uh, unity and affinity between the little parts and the big parts. And the, the device of, of repetition of shape is one of those means, a re repetition of shape in, in, in different variations and different sizes, is one of those ways whereby artists can produ produce a kind of, um, of continuity that sustains the picture from one end to the other. I, I think we're in absolute agreement that the artist uses his concern, or not uses his concern, but rather uh, has his concern uh, for uh, elemental expression or concern for the principles in order to give greater meaning to the painting. Specifically, we have a lady here who is reading a letter. The whole atmosphere of the room is such that it seems to be quiet and conducive. She doesn't seem to be uh, having any distractions either within the room or outside the room and the window is open. There, there appears to be no distractions. What I find particularly interesting in this painting is that the artist manages to convey this sense of quietness or placidity in terms of the natural setting uh, you know, the representational values. On the other hand, he does such extreme things in upsetting this, almost uh, guaranteeing or they, that it cannot happen. For instance, the wall in back of the opened window and the lady is partially obscured by the curtain and uh, the window itself, as well as the lady, and we think of it as a rectilinear shape, uh, probably uh, repeating the rectangle of the canvas itself. And it may, at first glance, seem to, to, to lack uh, interest uh, in shape compared to the other ones. But we find out that he has managed to subdivide it or break it up in so many interesting ways that when you begin to follow some of the subdivisions, it, uh, re it really uh, impresses you that he manages to hold on to this sense of order and uh, uh, placidity that I referred to originally. I'm thinking of how he breaks the contour in these larger divisions, but this whole thing seems to be broken to begin with in a, in a shape device, which is usually characterized by, by two straight lines at a right angle, then an opposite side turning into a curve. We get variations of this, for instance, in the window itself here, and then within this shape it begins, as in here, to become very complicated in terms of a motif which can be picked up in, in different places. While you're talking about that shape, there's something going on there that seems to me uh, very important, and that has to do with the, the, the way these spaces breathe. The, the vertical of the, of the window as it projects into that space, and the space made by that vertical edge with the contour of the woman's forehead and nose and and breast and hand and letter as those active forms roll down there working against that rectilinear shape it seems to set up a certain kind of tension but without without the clutter the the that if you look at that whole that whole shape you've been talking about the shape of the wall it has a kind of, of breathing quality about it and of alternations of tension and, and relaxation of open spaces and dense spaces in fact, wherever you look in this painting, you you find you never find a sense of, of awkwardness or clutter. You you move you move freely. Uh, if we're now just talking about the, the about the linear rhythms, they are all articulate in the sense that, that nothing nothing interferes with anything else. And yet, it's they're very exciting. But there is a kind of of sustained clarity and purity about the way these forms work together, making these uh, diff different kinds of tension relaxation. You were talking about about the vertical uh, division, and mentioning that that it's possible to feel a, a counter rectilinear element that works uh, horizontally, and I feel that too in terms of the of the position of the window on the left, of that strong light value, and then a kind of uh, a mass of light on the wall to the right of the woman, and then a certain sense of that continuity in the, or is it? <laughs> I'm not so sure that it is in the green curtain on the right. I, I have a feeling that it stops at the edge of that curtain. But anyway, I think there is a, a kind of felt rectangle including these light elements that acts as a counter to the vertical. Is that the same thing you're talking about? Yeah, okay. 
How impressed are you by what I was referring as the implication here of that? Does it exist for you at all? It does not exist for you. Oh, I see. The, the um, vertical segmentation is obvious compared to what I think happens in the horizontal divisions. I think they are, in general, more of an implied nature. But I do feel that if we can accept the repetition of the image as constituting a sense of the horizontal and through the central part of the composition, the image in the mirror of the lady who is reading, uh, it's not a mirror, the image in the, in, the, in the window glass, we have a reflection of her face so that we get a repetition of similar um, uh, configurations which make for me a strong horizontal, although an implied one. But we have below there immediately the uh, important uh, rug on the, on the table as well as the axis of the table, which reads as a horizontal. My question is, do we have to go all the way to the top of the painting and have the unbroken curtain rod before we get a repetition of a horizontal that we could reasonably expect him to use? For instance, we have them in the lead of the window, all of them operating as horizontals. I feel that there are certain creases in the drapes which may look very casual, but we can't accept them as casual. For instance, we know these are not casual, they're actually repetitions. I find one in particular over here, which seems to me to be on a level with this point over here, as well as this curve over here, which relates to it, that makes, by implication, however, a strong horizontal movement for me. Don't you feel that, that all the, the, the good paintings are, are constantly interlaced with, with those implied unities? The, 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 um, that this is a kind of, uh, of another structural level of a painting. There is the overt, the more, the more obvious uh, the divisions or, or, or linear patterns that have to do with contours. And then there are those others that are less related to contours and more related to direction this, or any kind of repetition that, that makes the eye move from, from like to like is likely to create that sense of, a, of another, a substructure. Um, is it too early to, to talk about the, um, the space in this, in this painting? I wonder if we could continue talking about implied linear rhythms we, the ones that we've uh, referred to now have been mainly angular, and I, oh, I feel that there is one which gives such a, a twisting, turning, writhing kind of implied continuity uh, that, uh, going back to what I said before about the paradoxical contrast of the uh, strong opposition of axes in the background that represents, uh, uh, in essence, the wall itself and how it is subdivided into uh, other shapes through shadows and overlapping. I find, along with this, uh, almost equally strong, a continuity of line which follows in such a, a way up through the drapery that I have several choices in here whether I want to follow this configuration which is in essence I think a repetition of the uh, kind of stepped effect here or whether I could go up this way and swing over and then from an implied because I find out that this business here relates to this shape here so that it is possible for me to make a, a jump or a very strong um, movement there if I follow that down I find that this movement it, which uh, bisects the, the composition, is an erratic series of conflicting curves. Well, you're on that subject of, of, the, of, the, of the counter a movement, um, not only a linear way, but in a, in a spatial way. Uh, the, the path you just described also involves a kind of back and forth in space, doesn't it? That is, the curtain on the left-hand side, the red curtain, projects out, then goes back to the vertical the drapery of it as it as it hangs over the window and is, I mean, over, yes, over the window and is behind it. Then, in a sense, you move out to the figure again, taking up this linear thing, which by now has become a spatial writhing, so that from the figure then onto the, to the rug and those convolutions in the rug, down then along the apples, and then picking up once you get started on these curvilinear flows of the thing, then, then the two big curves in the curtain also participate, and, and the, the bowing out of that curtain, the, the kind of of sense of a projection in it is is also tied up with with the, the bowing out in the curtain on the left hand side and with certain ins and outs in the rug on the table. 
As I look at this and begin to uh, to in, try to interpret the, the spatial order of the painting in terms of thrusts and, and possibly cantilevering as in the window as it goes into the room, uh, the projections, the uh, concavities and convexities, all these to be felt or to be thought of as relating to space. I wonder how I am to best accept the fact that the reds are on one side of the composition and that the majority of um, actions in terms of space are on the left side of the composition too. I'm trying to find something that will counteract this which has to do on the right side of the composition. We're not talking about space, about ins and outs, about those planes that turn one way and another roundnesses, uh, ins, ins and outs. I'm, I'm assuming that the, that the uh, fundamental space concept of this, of this painting um, is, is founded on a, a preoccupation with locating volumes in space with a kind of, of a possible clarity or, or movement around the volumes. That is, that the figure of the woman exists with, with an adequate sense of, of actual space between her and the wall, and that, that, that the, the concept of this uh, articulation of space has to do with a, a certain fullness of, uh, of uh, what is the word I want, displacement, the, the volumes having a certain re requirement and having an adequate uh, space in which, to, in which to exist. That the apples, the folds of the rug, the location of the table, the, the position of the chair, its plane in relationship to the plane of the window, the facet of the wall, the location of the of the of the cloth on the, on the right hand side, one in imagination can in a sense move behind that cloth. That has to do with what you were talking about of this answering. The, it is perfectly clear that, that the ins and outs on the left hand side are much more, more much more intricate. And as far as that aspect is concerned, those two points, the the pro rising projection of the of the of the rug on the table and the downward turn of the red cloth above and the, and the space that sort of leaps between those two and then the intricate ins and outs between those two points in relationship to the figure on the right seems kind of the key to the to that to, to, to that active aspect of the thing I'm, I'm curious if you feel the space behind that curtain on the right I wonder if the um, sense of, of opposition or contraposto in the figure itself uh, I read it as essentially a vertical, and yet there are counter oppositions of the head and uh, neck seemingly moving against the, the uh, waist, the, even the torso uh, comes out seemingly on the lower part, so that it's more like a, an S-curve uh, rather than a, a vertical or, or having the static uh, the quality of a truncated or pyramidal form. Do any of the movements in this figure, in terms of subdivisions that, that might oppose themselves as essentially being curves, are any of these of a nature that seem to move more to the right than to the left? I keep finding uh, that I want to make some, I want to allow for a compensation uh, for all the interest that's to the left in order to find what is counteracting that to the right. Uh, you said that. Uh, you know, I think I would just uh, would, would agree with agree with you about that. I wish I could could say what uh, what's on my mind about about the, um, the the volumes of this thing. And, and you were mentioning the the rhythm down the the front of the figure, reading that as as an egg shaped mass, and the the in relationship to the hands and the and the piece of paper. I find that very beautiful. The, the sort of massiveness of the head. The progression down the front of her, and then finding that, that kind of cave-like or valley-like uh, enclosure that the hands and the paper make in terms of the mass of the head. And in reading the, the definitions of space in there, then looking back at the window and the, the point of the window, that right angle, in relationship to this, this hollowed-out section that I've talked about. The hollows and, and bumps of this thing, having to do with a thing you mentioned earlier on the right far right-hand side of that recessive area in the curtain, having also to do with the projection of the red curtain on the left-hand side, 
and the, the, the rounded mass of the rug, and then the indentations that are cut into that, as well as the roundnesses and indentations of the apples. I, I think this thing is, is as clear as it could possibly, possibly be in every part in terms of that, of that, of that definition of space. It is the, I said this before, the clarity, the clarity of, of that spatial order that makes it, makes it seem so artful. By the way, it is a very formal picture, isn't it? It has, has that quality of, of artfulness in the extreme, it seems to me. I think that painting has a deceptive clarity as well as a deceptive simplicity about it. Maybe the clarity isn't deceptive, but the simplicity is. I think that the layman in looking at this might only concern himself with what meets the eye, so to speak, that the lady is here by a window reading a, a, a letter. Any kind of investigation shows that there's almost no shape, no um, tone, no direction that uh, isn't in there through um, a kind of intuitive sense of what is right for the composition. An element in this that we haven't touched on has to do with, with light and the use of light. Uh, it, it has a quality of being infused with light. Uh, relating, of course, to, to modeling, re relating somewhat to Vermeer's technique, which, uh, in a sense, antedated Impressionism. If, if you look at this reproduction or look at the Verme Vermeer closely, you see that he applied the paint in, in very small dots in certain places with, uh, with thicker paint than in other places, and those tiny little vibrating dots are, are obviously put there to, to catch the light and to create a sense of vibration, although that, that of course, is just a detail of the technique. But the, the way the light is used in this case, one can talk about the light in terms of the light and dark, the distribution of, of lights and darks, so the, same, the same complete control and ordering of these of the elements, of the weights of light and dark are, are clear in the thing, but the light is also used as a plas plastic element. That is it, it is, it is modulated and moved about in a very arbitrary way in, in order to, to define space and to, and to fill the the whole the whole canvas with a sense of of a light that comes from within it has in a sense two meanings that that, that sense of of a sort of glowing from within and the other having to do with the, with the plastic organization by plastic i mean the manipulation across the surfaces into and into space of the different forms part of my my worry before was the uh, fact that it didn't seem to be uh, strongly enough stated by me that the right side of the composition is minor and does not uh, take um, importance over other parts. And your mentioning the, the light at this point makes me more aware than I probably have been at any one point that the light is moving from left to right and this direction of the movement from left to right makes the right side of the composition more important than it does at any time if I uh, exclude this consideration of light and the movement of light. In terms of the vitality of the painting, it is, it is interesting now you mention that, that the, the movement, the, the sense of an actual flow of light bathing the, the canvas from left to right makes the, the location of all those things to the, to the left even more dramatic, doesn't it? That is that counter relationship of one thing to the other. One of, one of the important conventions in painting has to do with maintaining the, the reality, a sense of the reality of the picture plane. And many people in looking at a, at a Renaissance concept like this tend to think of, it, of, the, of the picture plane as simply a transparent window and in, a, in one sense, I think there was something of that attitude in the Renaissance about, about this marvelous uh, creation of perspective and other devices that made it possible to create the, a sense of volume and, and distance on a two-dimensional surface. But the artists nevertheless manage, in spite of the fact that, that they are dealing with, with projections into space and masses existing with atmosphere around them, somehow or another manage to maintain a sense of the of the real two-dimensional thing upon which the picture is, is created. In the case of this Vermeer, I think it's, uh, he achieves that sense of the, of the surface by balancing the things that go back with the things that move forward in such a refined way that together, the, the recessions and the projections 
evoke a kind of a stasis or, or, or re resolution that in a sense is the picture plane. The technical thing that you, you mentioned of, of ut utilizing equal detail in the distant parts and the, and the four parts also, the, the, whole, the whole technique, in, in a sense, is evocative of the surface. This rather smooth, fine, elegant kind of uh, mark making uh, on, on the uh, board. Is it the board? I'm not sure. In any case, the, the uh, a kind of, of uniformity of the, of the technique tends to make that plane be evident. I think I should have said in the beginning, Kenneth, that this painting gives me a particular sensuous pleasure and looking at the shapes that are in essence as purely abstract as anything in 20th century painting or sculpture. I'm referring now to something in, in terms of um, a sequence which is remarkable for its richness of contrast and that is the center part which includes the drapery and comes down by the uh, division of the, of the casement of the window and the frame itself and carries through in the swinging lines of the uh, fruit on the table and then comes up on the, the line of the drapery on the right hand side. I find one of the pleasures of this painting for me is for being able to contrast that. It's almost as though I isolate it as a pure abstract shape and it gives me a great deal of pleasure to, to um, relate that to the rectilinear form of the drapery and then going almost immediately in this uh, series of relationship to the extreme side where it, there is an elongation of something that is so uh, almost mechanical in the repetition of the intervals which in their overall form make a very clear concise rectilinear form. All of these of course having in, in, in general a vertical axis which relates to what you were saying in the beginning the placement of the figure in the center which of course is an upright figure. You know you mentioned something and might as well in, introduce a note of argument in this. Uh, you referred to that as a rectangle whereas in, in fact it is it, the curve of the right on the right hand side this, this, in a sense, goes back to that that kind of arbit the arbitrariness of the of the vertical tripartite the segmentation. Um, the fact is that that is a that it, that of the quality of that thing is that grand curve, and it is that curve in relationship to the shorter one on the, of the red on the left hand side, plus the uh, the straight edged uh, angularity of the of the window as it projects into that space, plus the, the true verticality of the sash of the edge of the, of the window that contributes to, to the richness of this. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I do, and I, do, I don't think it's a, an argument. I, um, when I read the left-hand side as being rectilinear, it, it's a long, narrow shaft, which with, of course, the, the curves at the top, which I cannot possibly uh, uh, separate or isolate. But I feel that this is a complement, as it were, to the, to the green a shape on the right, which again has a strong vertical axis, but which is composed of strong curves within it. So that if if there is uh, a feeling of the of the force of the curve in the upper left, there is also a reciprocal feeling of a curve in the uh, whole axis of the green on the right. In in the beginning, uh, you you made the point that uh, I think uh, has to be made in the beginning, and that is uh, we have an example of the artist. Uh, accepting the challenge of what uh, are, in many instances, the limitation of the symmetrical because of the encasement and the static nature of symmetry. And he uses that as a kind of a fulcrum on which he balances interplays and contrasts that work against the symmetry. In other words, having established that which is alike in the sense of weight, he immediately begins to, to show the dissimilarities within not only weights but lines and up to this point I haven't thought of it I, I, I thought of it but I haven't mentioned it and I'm sure you've thought of it but I don't think either mentioned it he has based this whole composition on um, a temperature a contrast between the warmth of the reds and the coolness of the greens which is just as diametric as what we are saying we haven't even mentioned the color the color organization of the thing either you mentioned earlier the, the dominance of, of red on the left-hand side. And the, 
there is a kind of shape, isn't there, made by red. And in this case, it's a, it's a, it has a kind of triangular character, the broad red base at the bottom and then the tapering of the red at the top. And if you look at, at the, the green, for, for example, in her sleeve, the yellow green and the green apple and the green curtain on the right, there's a kind of a counter triangle in green, so that in it, almost a symmetrical balancing of, of red and green, that both at rather low intensities, with, with, with the red more higher intensity than the green. But um, oddly enough, in terms of, of the basic location, massing of the color into a kind of, of symmetrical play across a, almost, a, maybe I'm exaggerating this, I sense at least a kind of a diagonal triangular red element on the left-hand side and a counter one uh, in green on the right-hand side, balancing. Okay.